All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you see my screen right now? I will, um, I think you can type in the chat to, to uh, me if you can see it. All right, great. Excellent. I just opened the broadcast a second ago, so I'll give, uh, I'll give everyone a minute just to hop in if they want to join, but awesome. We'll get started in one minute. All right, awesome. So we got a pretty good group here today. And uh, today, I'll start my video too, so you guys can see me. Um, yeah, so today we're basically gonna be talking about number theory games. And uh, number theory is a subject that I like a lot. And there's, um, there's some tie-in as well with uh, artificial intelligence that I'll get to in a bit, which uh, I think is really cool how it all connects together. So. I'm excited to share this with you all today and uh, let's get started. So I'm gonna basically begin by just going through a series of games of increasing difficulty. So I start with a game which I think you all will find fairly simple. And then as we go along, I will uh, increase the difficulty of the games. So let's, uh, so there's basically gonna be four games I talk, talk about today. So here is the very first one. So this is, uh, in most of these games, they're gonna be a version of a takeaway game in which you have chips in a pile and your only move on each turn is gonna be your enemy removing chips from a pile. So it sounds pretty easy, but we'll see how complicated we can get with it. So in this very first game, there's gonna be N chips on the table and we're gonna have two players, which you can call Alice and Bob, but for shorthand, I'm just gonna call them players A and player B, all right? And we're gonna assume that A makes the first move in all the games. So Alice always goes first. And in this game, each player in turn is gonna take away either one, two, three, four, or five chips from the pile. And the winner is gonna be the player who removes the final chip, leaving none for the other player. So I already see someone has uh, in the chat has figured out the strategy, but we're gonna go through this example by example because this is gonna lead up to some good theory for us. So let's start off and let's play the takeaway game for n equals 42 chips, with 42 being the meaning of life, universe, and everything. So for n equals 42, and you all can send your messages here. Uh, so send your messages in the chat. What do you want to do on your first move? There's 42 chips and you have an option of removing between one to five chips. So what do you want to do? So I'm seeing some responses. So uh, let's say, all right, so, so let's start with the largest value, all right? So let's say that you remove five. So you remove five chips, leaving 37 chips for me. Now it's my turn. And on my turn, I'm going to take away one chip, leaving 36 chips for everyone else. All right, what are you guys gonna do now? Five chips again? Let's see if it's a cons consensus here. So, all right, let's say you remove five chips. So you all remove five chips, uh, leaving 31 chips for me. Now I'm going to remove one chip, leaving 30 chips for everyone. What do you guys wanna do now? One, okay. Yeah, basically keep doing this until you lose. So if you remove one chip, that will leave 29 chips for me and I'll remove five chips, leaving you all with 24 chips. Um, do you wanna play, let's play this game to completion. So three more turns. 
What do you all want to do now? Three. So let's say you all remove three chips, leaving me with 21 chips. Then I'll remove three chips, leaving you with 18 chips. What do you want to do now? Four? Okay. You all remove four chips, leaving me with 14 chips. Now I'll remove two chips, leaving you all with 12 chips. <laughs> yeah, so two now, okay. So you all remove two chips with 10 chips. I'll remove four chips, leaving you all with six chips. All right, what do you want to do for your last move? Because I think you guys have figured out what's happened now. One, sure. You remove one chip and then I'll remove the last five. All right, so that's the basic gameplay. So it seems like you all kind of caught on to how the game works. Uh, let's just analyze the strategy. And we'll, an we'll start by analyzing the strategy very simply for this game, and then we'll get to some more complicated games. So the simplest possible scenario to begin with is if there are only one, two, three, four, or five chips in the pile, right? Because in all of those games, you really can just remove them all and immediately win. So in this case, player A can take them all and win immediately. And we'll call a position where that happens. We're going to call that position winning. And now I question to you all, and this was the last position that you were left off in, what happens when there are six chips in the pile? What happens now? So when there are six chips, what options do you have to do? Well, yeah, so what Kevin said there works. Uh, because losing, because no matter what you do, the other person can take the rest. So if there are six chips, player one can either take one, two, three, four, or five chips, right? And then we'll see all of these cases here. So if they take one chip, then player B will have five chips, and then the other player can win. If they take two chips, and no, they're not allowed to sneak in another. Uh, if they take two chips, then player B will have four chips and they can win. If they take three chips, player B will ha then have three chips and they'll win, and so forth. Therefore, we're going to call six a losing position because from the position six, every single possibility that we get to is then losing because the other player is going to win. So that's the basic terminology of the game. And over here, I'm going to show you all a little bit of a diagram. And I like to view... Um, yes, so the goal here is to get to your opponent uh, on a move where they have six chips. And I like kind of visualizing these games as well. So with the green circles that I'm representing here, those are going to be the winning positions, whereas the red squares are going to be the losing positions. And the arrows basically represent possible moves. So in this case, we see that when there's one, two, three, four, or five chips, we can remove them all and immediately win. So all these circles are colored green. However, on the other hand, six is a square and it's a red because it's losing. Because from every single possible move that we have here, we see that uh, we're going to leave our opponent in a winning position. Now, increasing the size of the game a little bit, if there are seven, eight, nine, ten, or eleven chips, we see that those are all winning positions as well. Because from seven chips, you can remove one, which puts your opponent in the position six, from which place they then are going to lose, because we just saw that. Same with 8, 9, 10, and 11. However, again, when we increase it again, we get and we see that 12 is losing. Because from 12, your only options are moved to 7, 8, 9, 10, or 11, from which place your opponent can then win. So that's the basic diagram. Does the diagram make sense to everyone? Cool. Uh, so now, what do you notice about all of the red squares? What property do all of the red squares satisfy? Multiples of six. Hmm. Okay. So all the multiples of six seem to be losing positions. Let's see if we can prove this. So we claim that all multiples of six are losing, while all non-multiples of six are winning. So to prove this, we're going to have to uh, demonstrate two properties. And these two properties are going to show up time and time again throughout this talk. So the two top properties that we must show is that from every winning position, which is a non-multiple six, we have a move to, make the, to move the opponent to a losing position, which is a multiple of six. 
And furthermore, from every losing position, every possible move is to a winning position. I'll back up for a second here. So in this previous diagram that we, that we saw, uh, we saw that from every single winning position, that we had at least one move that moved the opponent to a losing position. So for instance, from seven, eight, nine, 10, and 11, we didn't need every single move to be to a winning position. We just knew from seven, if we take one chip, then we leave our opponent with six and we win. Same with eight, nine, 10, or 11. However, from every losing position like 12, every single possible move to seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 are losing. So those, those are the two things that we need to show to show this in general. And to do this, we are now gonna use a little bit of number theory because we've taken our uh, chips and our piles and we've now converted this into a problem about numbers. And yes, we are going to assume that all players play optimally. Um, so we're gonna assume that they're all uh, making smart moves whenever it's their choice. So for the first part, we are claiming that from every non-multiple six, we have a move to make it a multiple of six, basically. So there's a very convenient way to write numbers that are not a multiple of six. And this is known as the division algorithm in number theory, where we write n equals six times a quotient plus a remainder. And because we're assuming that uh, n is not a multiple of six, the remainder cannot be zero. So we know that the remainder is between one and five which is really convenient because our choices for the number of chips to remove are also between one and five. So we can simply subtract off our chips to leave our opponent in a multiple of six. So we know that from a non-multiple of six, we have a move to make it a multiple of six, which should make sense because we can also think of it in terms of the mod six residue. You can just subtract off the mod six residue, or you can think of it in any of those ways. Now, on the other hand, we have to show that from a multiple of six, every possible move is going to be to a, to a winning position, which is a non-multiple of six. And to see this, well, if a number is a multiple of six, then you can write n as six times q for some integer q. And after we subtract away a number of chips that are between one and five, sorry, there should be a five there. Um, after we subtract away a number of chips that are between one and five, the second player is left with six Q minus R chips, which isn't a multiple of six. Does that make sense? Are there any questions on that general strategy there? All right, if there are no questions on that, uh, let's go back up and let's see if we can win back at the original game. So we're gonna go back up to the very original game and I'm gonna let you all uh, take the driving wheel here. And I want you to beat me for the takeaway game with n equals 50, okay? So we have n equals 50 here. What is the optimal first move? Great, I see all of you are saying takeaway two, good. So you take away two, leaving me with 48 chips. Okay, now let's say I take away five, leaving you all with 43 chips. Then what do you do? Awesome, all right. I see everyone sending in one. So you all take away one, leaving me with 42 chips. Now let's say I take away three, leaving you with 39 chips. Awesome, so you all take away three, leaving me with 36 chips. Now let's say I take away four, leaving you with 32 chips. What do you do now? So you all take away two, leaving me with 30 chips. I'll go small. I'll take away one, leaving you with 29 chips. Okay, you all take away five, leaving me with 24 chips. I'll take away two, leaving you with 22 chips. What do you do now? Good. You all take away four, leaving me with 18 chips. I'll take away five to speed this up to uh, leave you with 13. You all take away one, leaving me with 12. Uh, let's say I take away three now again, leaving you with nine. You all take away three, leaving me with six. All right. And now we all know how this is going to end. Uh, let's say I take away five, leaving you with one. You all take away one and you win. 
yeah, we can still call this a game, even though it is a little bit of a trap, to be honest. Uh, oh, uh, do you guys not see when I type it out? Do you see this now? Gotcha. Okay. Sorry. I, uh, when I was typing into the chat there, I don't think that you were able to see it. So yeah, I sent it to just the panelists. Um, so yeah, so sorry. I will make sure that in the next thing, but it seems like you all got the main idea there, which is the important thing. So cool. Let us move on to a second game. So here is a second game. And this game is going to be a divisors game. All right. So let's say that there are 60 chips on the table and we have two players A and B with A making the first move again. So Alice is always going first. So each player in turn is gonna generate a new number by subtracting a positive proper divisor from the current sum. Do you know what a proper divisor means? All right. So a proper divisor is a divisor of the number that is not the number itself. So for instance, the proper divisors of the number six are one, two, and three. So one is a proper divisor, but the number six itself is not a proper divisor. As a small aside, the reason I mentioned the number six is the number six is a perfect number because it's actually equal to the sum of all of its proper divisors, which is kind of cool because there are only 50 known perfect or 51 known perfect uh, numbers right now. Yeah, so it's 28, 496, there's quite a few of them, but they get more and more sparse as you go out. Um, so anyway, so back to the game here. Uh, so we have two players and we have 60 chips on the table. And instead of doing it with 60 chips, because 60 chips may take a little bit of a long time depending on how small numbers uh, uh, we have, uh, is just responding to the question really quickly. Uh, is there a, a way to prove infinite number or finite number of perfect numbers? Uh, they're generated by something called Mersenne primes, uh, which are primes of the form two to the P minus one. And there's only 50 of those that are known. No known odd perfect numbers are known at this time. So I don't think there's an infinite number in my opinion, but who knows, numbers go on for a while. So let's say we start instead with only 10 chips, okay? And all right, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll go first, okay? So I'll go first. So on my first move, I will take one chip leaving you, actually, actually, you know, sorry, let, let's play out the full game. Let's do it with 60 chips, all right? And uh, on my first move, I will take away Let's see, 15 chips, leaving you with 45 chips. So it's 45 chips and it's your turn. What do you all want to do with 45 chips? So I see one vote for 15. Any other votes from uh, the position of 45 chips? Another vote for 15. Nine, 15. All right, so let's say you all take away 15, leaving me with 30 chips. All right, I will now take three chips, leaving you all with 27 chips. What do you wanna do now? Nine chips, okay. So you all take away nine chips, leaving me with 18 chips. I will now also take away nine chips, leaving you with nine chips. What do you wanna do with nine chips now? Three? Okay, you all take away three chips, leaving me with six chips. I'll take away three chips as well, leaving you with three chips. What do you wanna do now? You only have one option because there's only one proper divisor of one. So you all take away one chip, leaving me with two chips. However, from here, I can now take away one chip, leaving you with one chip and winning. Because uh, in the strategy of the game, the winner is a player who makes the number one. 
So from two, I take away one, leaving you, you all with one, and that's the winning position for me. Um, I was playing optimally there. So I was using the optimal strategy in that, but I will now teach you all the optimal strategy so you can beat me when we play it a second time. All right. So in this game, Alice, who I guess is me, has the winning strategy. And as a lot of you suggested as well, going backwards is probably the best way. So I don't think this is fully how the game uh, played out, but here was another sample game that I had prepared ahead of time. Um, so the sample game that I had uh, prepared ahead of time had this for A and B. And yes, I did do the math jam about the same topic, but I'm gonna do some slightly different stuff later on. So Alice had 60 chips and he took away 15, then you all took away 15. And do you notice anything about the numbers A and B? Anything in particular? So I see two suggestions here say that B is odd and all the numbers in A are all even, which is kind of interesting because, and if you scroll up at our game too, it went slightly different how, than how the sample game that I had drawn out here, um, but it was the same exact thing. All the numbers on my term were even, and then I put you all in all of the odd numbers. So let's start at a very simple, let's go backwards and see if we can build our way up. So we'll consider some simpler versions of the game to get us started. So as we saw before, when there are only two chips, then player A will immediately win since they can take one. However, when there are three chips, player has no choice but to take one, leaving me with, or their opponent with two, which is then winning for them. So three is a losing position. So now when there are four chips, player A has the option between either taking one or two chips. Which of the two options should they choose? So I see a bit of a split vote here in the chat between one and two. And let's take a look at both of them. So if I take away one, then I'll leave the opponent with three, which is losing, right? So if I take away one, then I'll leave the opponent with three from which place they'll lose. However, if I take away two, then I'll leave the opponent with two from which place they'll then win. One way you can think of it is a winning position is a position that you want it to be your turn on, whereas a losing position is a position where you don't want it to be your turn. So a losing position is a position you want to put the other player in. So in this case, you want to take away one chip, leaving your opponent with three. So doing that, we see that four is then a winning position. I'm going to show you all another visual representation of the game that I like to see here. And in this visual representation, again, the green circles are, are the winning positions, whereas the red squares are the losing positions. So we see that the number two is circled green because it's winning, three was losing. From four, we had two choices, but we always want to make sure that we have a move to a losing position for the opponent. So we made the move to three. From five, we only had the move to four, so five is losing. From six, we actually have a lot of choices. As I mentioned before, six has quite a few divisors. But one is a divisor of six, so we can subtract one, leaving our opponent with five. Two is also a divisor of six. However, we don't want to take two, because if we take away two, then we'll leave our opponent with four, which is winning for them. So we want to take away either one or three. And as you're noticing from this, all of the numbers that are circled green are even whereas all the numbers that are uh, red are odd. So the question now comes, are all of the even numbers winning while all the odd numbers are losing? And let's take a look at this. Let's see if we can actually prove this using the same framework we saw in the previous problem uh, to win the game in general. So I claim that all the odd numbers are losing while all of the even numbers are winning. And to prove this, we must demonstrate the two properties again. So the two properties are that from every winning position, we have a single move, at least one move, to move it to a losing position, which is odd. 
However, from every losing position, every possible move is to a winning position, which is even. Let's back up really quickly. I'm gonna show you the diagrams on the last page one more time with that in mind. So for the position nine, every single possible move to either eight or six are both to a winning position. From the position eight, while we have several pretty bad candidate moves, for instance, to six or to four, all we need is that there's one single move to a winning position, which is seven. So now let's prove this. So for the first claim from every even position, we have a move to an odd position. It actually turns out to be pretty simple because we know that if for any natural number, one is always a proper divisor of it. And if n is an even number, then n minus one is odd, so we always have a move to an odd number. It can be advantageous just to speed up the game to pick a larger odd divisor. However, in this case, one just suffices for our proof. Now, for the other way, if a number n is odd, what do we know about all the divisors of an odd number? All right, so we know that all of the divisors of an odd number are also odd. So if we have a number n is odd, and we choose an arbitrary divisor d of the number n, then we know that d also has to be odd. So in that case, then we have that n minus d is even, because odd minus odd is even. So every possible move from an odd position is always to an even position. So we've proven the two claims that we want. We know from every winning position, we have a move to a losing position. From every losing position, all of our possible moves are to a winning position. Cool. Do you all want to try beating me in a game now that you know the strategy? Let's do it. Uh, well, let's start with maybe a smaller number. So instead of 60, uh, I'll let you all start with 30. So what do you want to do from 30? How many chips do you want to take? Oh, quite a few votes. I see votes for one, three, and 15. I think 15 got the most votes. So let's say you all take away 15, leaving me with 15. I'll now take away three, leaving you with 12. What do you want to do with 12 chips now? All right, I see everyone posting three. So you all take away three, leaving me with nine. And from nine, as we saw in the diagram before, we know this is gonna be losing for me, but let's just play it out. I'll take away one, leaving you with eight. What do you want to do with eight chips? How many do you wanna take away? Good. I was hoping no one would say two or four. You all take away one chip, leaving me with seven. I also take away one, leaving you with six. What do you wanna do with six chips now? So you all take away three, leaving me with three. Now I have to take away one, leaving you with two. And how do you win the game now? So you all take away one, uh, leaving me with one, so you win. Awesome. So. The game looked kind of tricky at first, but just using a little bit of analysis with parity, it turned out to be pretty easy to see that uh, the winning strategy just was odd numbers and even numbers. So cool. I'm now going to talk about something just slightly different. I'm gonna get back to the games in a minute, but you may be asking at this point, okay, these games are kind of fun and they're fun to play and maybe I'll play them with a friend or family member, hopefully over Zoom or online. And I, uh, and I now know how to beat them, which is always fun. But what about other games? What about other games that we care about that are not necessarily numbered games? So we noticed that in the last two proofs, we kind of had this general framework. From every winning position, we have a move to a losing position. Whereas on the other hand, 
from every losing position, every possible move is to a winning position. It turns out that this same type of analysis can actually be used to draw conclusions in the game tic-tac-toe. So in tic-tac-toe, the outcome of a game for player X, so we're going to move from Alice Bob to just players X and O, the outcome of the game for player X is either a win, which we'll call a score of one, a draw, which happens a lot, a score of zero, or a loss, which will give that a score of minus one. So at each stage of the game, the goal for player X is to maximize their score, whereas the goal for player O is to minimize player X's score. Okay, now how does this fit into the framework? So I get, I'm going to give you guys an example of the game of tic-tac-toe. And in the following position, we're going to use a very similar analysis to what we just did to see which player has a winning strategy. So in this diagram, it's currently X to move. Who do you think is going to win this game of tic-tac-toe? X or O? You just type in the chat. So I see a bunch of different votes. So I see votes for X, I see votes for O, and I see votes for Ty. So it is currently X's turn because X has played three and O has played three as well. So I'm gonna do a full analysis on, on the next page and we'll take a look and we'll see how the uh, same framework applies. So th this wasn't my own uh, diagram. This was uh, generated from an AI course online. And let's take a look at this tree here. So this was the initial starting position, right? And the way that we can think of these two players is that one of them is trying to maximize the score and one of them is trying to minimize the score. X is trying to maximize, whereas O is trying to minimize. So this is a game tree. And in the game tree, each move that is below a tree is made from playing a move in the above tree. So for instance, uh, to go from the top tree here to this tree down here, we just make, we play X right there. Whereas to go to this tree, we play X right there. And to go to the bottom tree, we play X in the bottom right corner. So those are the three options. And we can see how all of the games are going to play out when we do this. Because if X plays there, then O now has two choices. They can either play in the middle center or in the middle bottom right here or in the bottom right corner. And at the end of the board, so on the very bottom column or the very bottom row, what we're going to see is we're going to see the final scores for all of the games. So for instance, this game tree that's at the bottom here, that is going to be a draw because no one wins. In the tree right to the right of it, because X has three in a row, it has a score of one. In the tree that's in the column or in the row right before it, because O has three in a row, that has a score of minus one. And we can now see how using maximum and minimum, we can kind of back up the scores from the uh, root of the tree, all the, or from the leaves of the tree, all the way back to the root. So the leaves of the tree are the very final positions, whereas the root was the initial position that we wanted to analyze. So uh, remember that on X's turn, they're trying to maximize the score. O's turn, they're trying to minimize the score. So at the end of the tree, so at the right here, can you all see my mouse, by the way, when I'm circling over stuff? Yeah, okay, good, good, good. good. Um, just wanted to make sure. <laughs> because if not, then this may be a little bit confusing. Um, so from the very final position here uh, that I'm circling, there's only one possible move for O, so this has a score of zero. What, whereas this position over here, uh, X has a winning move, so it has a score of one. However, now over here, because it's a minimizing position, O has a choice. O has a choice to either move to a position that's zero or to a position that is one. What are the two ones should it move to? Should it move to the zero one or should it move to the one one? So remember, this is O that is currently playing. And O is the minimizing player. O wants to minimize the score. Good, so O right here should move to zero. Now let's analyze, so this branch right here is just a score of zero, which is a draw. 
And now X is going to see, can I do any better with any of the other plays? Um, so I have a question at the bottom. How do you determine which is zero, one, or minus one? Uh, one is a win for X, zero is a draw, and minus one is a win for O. So for instance, this one right here is a draw, this one right here is a win for X, and this one right here is a win for O. Does that make sense? And then to go from these values at the bottom back up, we just either take the maximum or the minimum of the values that are below it. So now let's say that X makes maybe a silly move. So let's say that X plays right here. However, then O has an immediate response from which they can win. Because if O plays right there, then they have three in a row. And because O is trying to minimize their score, they're just gonna make that move. So we know that the value of this move is minus one. Similarly, if X plays in the bottom right corner, then again, O has a move to immediately win. So that uh, branch is also gonna have a score of minus one. So we see between X's three possibilities, they're at the very top here, they have either a choice to move to a score of zero, minus one, or minus one. However, these are taking the maximum of those values. What score should they move to? Or where should they play, I guess? Yeah, sure. So I see either one, two is a play, or they should move to the score of zero. Because they're trying to take the maximum of these three values, and the best one they can do is zero. So in this case, the game is going to be a draw. And with the orange arrows as well, you can see with the optimal play by both players how the game will play out. Um, and we'll see that the game should result in a draw if both players play completely optimally. And um, yeah, that's kind of very similar to our analysis in the previous one because whereas a maximizing player needs to have just one good move, a minimizing player needs to have um, all their moves. So I see there's a question. Uh, do you want to type your question out or do you want to talk it? Or do you want to speak it aloud? Um, let's see, I'm not sure how to give someone speaking abilities, but... Um, all right, so yeah, just in general, if you have a question, it's probably easier to, um, okay. It's probably easier to either type it or to go into the uh, Q&A part. But I think it was clear, you had a question? All right, so. I'm not sure if they actually had a question or not, so I will I'll mo move on from here. Okay, cool. Sorry, I'm still figuring out how all the Zoom features work as I'm doing this too. So that was just a very simple kind of toy example of a game of tic-tac-toe, which hopefully you've all seen before. Hopefully you, you all know kind of the strategy for winning a tic-tac-toe as well. But we can talk about some other games really quickly. All right, so let's, um, so in the above game tree, we only searched to a depth of three. But the same type of analysis can also be applied to the game of Connect Four, for instance. And uh, we often use a variant of the minimax search that's instead called an alpha beta pruning, which lets us eliminate several branches so that we can search even faster. So on the last slide here, we uh, had noticed that some of the branches were kind of grayed out. And, uh, and so those are ones that we don't have to search because we already know that O has a winning move. So why should we consider a bad move for O if we know that O can win from a certain position? And I see there's a question, is there a win tie strategy for Connect Four? Yes, there is, but it's only known to computers. The strategy doesn't make any sense to humans. So there is a deterministic strategy that you can always, I think either win or tie from Connect Four, but it's only understandable to computers. So, <laughs> all right. 
So the game of checkers, which is a little bit more complicated, was actually solved by a professor at my school by the name of Jonathan Schaefer. And he used a variant on this called alpha beta search along with an extensive endgame database. So the game of checkers is also solved. And it is to date the largest game that has actually been solved by a computer. Because so when we go to more complicated games, there's just way too many states to possibly consider to solve them fully. And you read my mind, the very next one I was gonna talk about was chess. So the computer program that beat Gary Kasparov at chess, which is Deep Blue, used a variant on min-max and a search to a depth of 24, which if you consider the number of possible moves in chess, that's a really far depth, or 12 plies, which means just moves per um, player. But since a chess game can go on for a really long time, what they used at the end, whereas with tic-tac-toe, we, we know the scores at the end of the game, either X wins, O wins, or to draw, they had to use something called a heuristic to evaluate the final position, which is just an estimate of how good the position is for each player. And if you know how scoring works in chess, like a bishop is three points, a queen is nine points, it could just be the difference in material that's on the board. Um, and yeah, Gary could have won that, but now the best computers would beat the best player in the world at chess, who's uh, Magnus Carlsen, I think. And the very last one I'll talk about, and this was the most complicated game. Uh, and yeah, the next question was one about Go. So in 2016, researchers at DeepMind uh, beat the uh, world champion in Go, Lisa Dole, in a very highly uh, touted match that got a lot of media attention and uh, a lot of attention worldwide. And they use a slightly more complicated search method. And I could, uh, I took a full class on this and it was really cool to see. I could go on for several hours about Go, but they, in short, if you want to search it up later, they use something called Monte Carlo tree search along with a lot of deep neural networks, which are way too complicated for me to talk about today, but I just wanted to mention it briefly. And yeah, the creator of the computer can't beat the world best player because they were just doing code. So they weren't doing, they didn't actually learn any Go. They just were making a program that was really good at beating it. I see a question by Edwin. Edwin, do you want to ask a question? All right, maybe not. Um, and do humans still get a chance to win? I mean, now it's basically impossible for a human to beat a top computer at a game like chess or go or any of those but there's still a lot of element to human versus human competition so in these games computers have won the battle but there's still a lot of things that um that humans are better than computers so i just wanted to mention that because you can kind of view these games in a vacuum but it's kind of cool to see oh wait these same strategies apply to much more complicated games and yes, if you're able to put a computer in a human mind, then maybe a human could actually beat a computer at one of these games. So let's move on. I have two more games to talk about here, and I think both of them are fun. And both of them are games that you all can beat me at after we finish playing. So the next game that I want to talk about is known as NIM. And NIM is a really fun game, and it leads to a lot of cool strategy. So the game of NIM, there are four piles um, we'll call them chips of size one, three, five, and seven. And they're represented here. So the very top pile has one chip, then the one below it has three chips, then five chips and seven chips. And so we have two players that are gonna take turns. They're gonna choose a pile so they can choose a pile and then they can have to take at least one chip from the pile and they can take as many chips as they want. And the game continues until there are no stones remaining. And there are kind of two ways you can play this game. Either you can play it that the player to take the last stone wins or the player to take the last chip loses. So you can play it either of those ways. We're just gonna focus on normal play, but I'll talk about the other play because it's interesting as well in a moment. So at first with one, three, five, and seven stones, it's a little bit complicated to see how you'd come up with a strategy. So one great problem solving strategy that doesn't just apply here, it applies to all math problems you may come across is if something seems complicated, let's go to one of the simplest possible examples. So simpler, much simpler game. Uh oh, did I just lose my screen? Oh, there it is. Can you all still see it? Hmm. 
No. All right. Uh, let me. Yeah, one sec. Let me just get back to it. All right. How about now? Is that good? Okay, cool. My bad. <laughs> Sweet. So let's go to a simpler possible again. Let's say that there are only two piles. And we'll start super simple. So let's say that there are two piles that both have one chip each. And we're just assuming normal play. So that means that the last player to remove a chip wins. So if there are uh, two piles, one chip each, which player will win? The first player or the second player? All right. So I see a lot of votes for the second player and the second player will win. Since the first player will remove one chip and then B will remove the other. And there's a really good question. Is there a strategy for Mizir in the first game? I'm actually not entirely sure. I think the goal would be to get to one instead of zero then because from one your opponent is forced to lose but I have to flesh that out a bit more. So, so, okay. So if there are two piles of both sides one, then the second player will win. Now let's say that one pile has one chip and the other one has two chips, which we're going to represent by two, one. What can player A do to guarantee a win in this position? Any guesses for a good move? All right, there's good. There's one. Cool. So we can remove one ship from the pile of two. Oh, someone asked, can we see the rules, rules again? Yes, I'll go back to the rules really quick. So the rules are you alternate uh, choosing a pile, taking at least one chip from the pile, and then you continue until there are no chips remaining. And we're just assuming right now this top one, which is the player to take the last uh, chip wins. So anyway, so in this position, uh oh, I lost it again. There we go, back up. All right, so in this position, which we had, which was 2-1, I saw a lot of votes for we can take one chip from the second uh, from the pile with two in order to win. So let's do that. So if we take one chip from the pile of two, then the other play player will be left in the position 2-1, which we saw above was losing for them. So therefore, 2-1 is a winning position if we remove one from the pile of two. Now, by the same logic, any position of the form n comma one is going to be winning. Because you can simply remove n minus one chips from that pile, and then you put your opponent in a losing position. So any position, so for instance, in the position four one, what would you do to win? Take three and you'll leave your opponent, opponent in the position one one. Beautiful. So I, I'm gonna kind of represent this in a table as we go along. So I have the position on the left and the value, whether it's winning or losing on the right. Great. So now my next question to you all is one about the position two two. Do you think this is a winning position or do you think it's losing? I see a few, quite a few votes here. Most of them are that it is losing. And let's take a look. So well, let's assume that we remove chips in a second pile for now. So this will leave our opponent in either the position 2-1 or 2-0. However, we saw above that 2-1 was a winning position. And we also know that 2-0 is also pretty trivially winning because you can just remove all two chips in the first pile to win. 
So with either of these choices, we see that 2-2 two, two is a losing position. All right, so now by the same logic, we see that n comma 2 is always going to be winning for n is at least 3. Because you're going to remove n minus, chips, n minus 2 chips from the first pile to leave your opponent in 2-2, two, two, which is then losing for them. So we can update our table like this. And finally, this is the last uh, two pile example I'll do. What can we say about the position three comma three? Do you all think that's a winning position or a losing position? All right, so Let's, uh, let's do a little bit of casework for the position 3-3. Three, three. So we're in a condition on the number of chips that we can remove in this second pile. So our options are if we remove one chip, we leave our opponent in the position 3-2, which is winning for them. If we remove two chips, you'll leave our opponent in 3-1, which is winning for them. Or if you remove three chips, you'll leave your opponent in 3-0, which is winning for them. So therefore, 3-3 three, three is a losing position since all of our moves lead to our opponent winning. And it seems that any position where the two piles are balanced, or in other words, are equal or losing, while any position in which the two piles are unbalanced are winning. And as a few of you just said, this seems to imply that the position n comma n is always going to be losing. And to prove this, we just need two of the following statements which is that from every winning position, we have a move to balance it. And from every balanced position, we have to unbalance it. And I could write this out using induction or variables or some complicated stuff, but I think it's more intuitive to just see with a simple example. So I'm gonna give you guys a general position and I want you to beat me using this balancing strategy. So let's say that the initial position is 15, 12. What should you do to win from this position? Excellent. So there's quite a few votes for take three from the pile of 15 and you take three from the pile of 15 to balance it and produce 12-12. Now let's say I take four from the pile of 12 to produce 12 comma eight. What should you do now? Cool. That's quite a few votes and you're just copying my moves at this point. So you, we're just playing again the copycat. So I took four, you take four. So you take four to leave us an eight, eight. Let's now say I take three to leave you in the position eight, five. What do you do now? Three, zero, great. So you take three to leave me in the position five, five. Let's say I take four to leave you in the position five, one. What do you do now again? Copy me again. You guys are just good at copying me. So uh, you take four, leaving me in the position one, one. I take one, leaving you in the position one, zero. And finally, what do you do to win the game? You take one. You take one to leave me in the position zero, zero. Great. So with two piles, it literally is just a game of you want to balance the positions, and as soon as they're unbalanced, you just take off enough chips to balance them. So it's pretty intuitive, right? We will now extend our analysis. Let's now instead say that there are three piles. All right? So I just put this on a table. I say that in a position A, B, where A is not equal to B, that's winning because it's unbalanced, and B, B, where uh, the two values are equal is losing. So now one of the easiest positions with three piles are when two piles are already equal, such as in the position A comma B comma B. What should we do in this position? Any ideas for a good move?
great. So I see quite a few votes that are saying, just take all of A, because then it's just two pi on them. And then we know that we'll leave our opponent in BB, which is already losing. So therefore the position A comma B comma B is therefore a winning position. Let's now go to the first position in three pile NIM in which the three piles are different actually. So my question to you is what about the position three comma two comma one? Is that a winning position or is that a losing position? And I'll give you a minute to think about this one because it's not immediately obvious. Oh, great. All right, it seems like a lot of you have figured this out. Okay. So you all say that three, two, one is a losing position. In order to analyze this, I made a little bit of a tree again, just to analyze the possible moves. So for each of the possible moves, I represent it through an arrow. So for instance, if I take three chips from the first pile, I get to zero, two, one. If I take two chips, I go to one, two, one. If I take one chip, I go to two, two, one. And now, what do we notice about all the positions that we end up with? What are all of these new positions that are in the green circle? Well, they're all winning positions. And they're all winning positions since they're either of the form a comma b, where a is not equal to b, or they're of the form a comma b comma b, where two piles are equal. So we either have two piles that are unequal or we have three piles in which two of them are equal. So for instance, for all of these, one, two, one, two, two, one, and three, one, one, we have two piles that are equal. And all the other ones, we only have two piles and the two piles are not equal. So all the possible moves um, are gonna be losing because they put our opponent in a winning position. And now as one more question, what about the position four, three, one? What should we do here? There you go. So in the position four, three, one, because we just saw that three, two, one was losing. So we want to put our opponent in it. Let's take two from the, let's take two from the first pile. Because if you take two from the first pile, then you leave your opponent in the position two, three, one, or which is the same as three, two, one, which is already losing. So we saw that three, two, one was losing, four, three, one was then winning. All right, and we can extend the analysis and keep on doing this for larger and larger piles, but it's gonna be really complicated and it's gonna get even more complicated as soon as we get to the four pile case as well. So I'm gonna show you all just some general winning and losing positions. So in this table right here, these are all the positions that you want um, to get your opponent to. So when there are only two piles, you want to get your opponent to a position like 2-2, two, 3-3, two, three, three, four, 4 obviously 1-1 one, one as well. Any of those um, positions are good. When there are three piles, you want to get your position, your opponent to a position like 1-2-3. It turns out 1-4-5 is also losing, 1-6-7 is losing, 1-8-9 is losing, and all of these positions are losing. And when there are four piles, it turns out that um, if two of the piles are equal, like if you have the position one, one, and then two, two, that also is a losing position. Because again, you can kind of do the same copying strategy as before. And you also will see that the position one, three, five, seven is also listed as being a uh, losing position. So what I want to do really quickly, so I'm not gonna explain actually why all of these uh, piles are this way, but I wanna see, and I will explain in a moment afterwards, I wanna see if using this table and this table alone, if we're able to come up with a good winning strategy for the case of, uh, of NIM. And we're gonna start with the position one, three, five, seven. I wanna see if you all can beat me using optimal play, just using this table. So let's say we're currently in the position 
one, three, five, seven. On my move, I'm going to remove one from the pile of five to put you all in the position one, three, four, seven. What should you do now? And as a hint, look at the table. So see, there are a lot of different votes so far. All right, that looks good. So we take one from the seven to, to move us to the position one, three, four, six. Sweet. Now let's say I remove one. Hmm. Let's say I remove one from the pile of four to move you to the position one, two, three, six. Or sorry, one, three, three, six. What should you do now? So the new position is one, three, three, six. You actually don't lose. From here, you do have a winning move. Great. Seems like a lot of you are getting this. So remove five from the pile of six to put your opponent in the position one, one, three, three. And from here, we have two equal piles. So it's the copying game. Let's say I remove one from the pile of three to move you to the position one, one, two, three. What can you do here? And actually you have two choices. Means you can either move to the position one, two, three, or if you take one from the three, you can take one from the three to move to the position one, one, three, three. Great. And, or sorry, one, one, two, two, my bad. Now from here, let's say I remove two from the pile of two to move you to the position one, one, two. What do you do now? Um, so from here, take the remaining two, leaving me in the position one, one, which we already know is losing. So using this table, you were able to win at the game of M. But now your question most likely is, all right, how did we come up with the table in that first place? Because you know that you probably already ran these out on a computer or using some analysis, but how did you come up with that table? And yeah, in order to do that, we need to find a pattern which holds for these games. And I'm gonna show you what the pattern is. I'll come back to the Mazir play in a second uh, because it is interesting. But this pattern is gonna be something called the nim sum between two numbers. So the nim sum of two numbers A and B, and we denote it with this weird symbol. So this little plus symbol is how we denote it. So it's denoted A plus B. And to form the nim sum of numbers, we're gonna write the numbers in binary and you basically add without carry. Um, on a computer, this is known as exclusive or, and you may have seen this um, before if you use the caret operator, if you use this operator in Python, you may have seen it. So anyways, so for piles of size one, three, five, and seven, what we're gonna do is we're gonna consider writing all the numbers out in binary. So one in binary is just zero, zero, one. 3 in binary is 0, 1, 1, 5 in binary is 1, 0, 1, and 7 in binary is 1, 1, 1. And now what we're going to do in order to compute the nim sum is we're basically going to go along each of the possible columns. And I think I actually have an annotate. Um, let's see, how do I use this? All right, there's a drawability. Cool. All right, um, so we're going to start by going over this column right here with all of the ones. 
So if we take the nim sum of this column of four ones, since we have an even number of ones, we're going to say that nim sum is then zero. All right. For the column of two to the first power, we're going to have, again, two ones, so it's also zero. And in the two to the second power, we also have uh, two ones, so it's also zero. So the nim sum of the four piles is equal to zero. And in this case, we then say that a position is balanced. Otherwise, we say that a position is unbalanced. And just to see how this kind of relates to the two pile case, if we have two piles, like let's say we have two piles of four, we can write four as one, zero, zero. Or we can also write four as one, zero, zero. So when we take the nim sum between the two of them, we're going to get 0, 0, 0. So the nim sum of our, four, uh, of our two piles there is just 0. So it kind of matches with the same uh, intuition that we had before. So when the nim sum is 0, we call it balanced. When it's not 0, we call it unbalanced. And my next question to everyone is, can you compute the nim sum of 5, 6, and 7? So give that a go. Try on a piece of paper. Compute the nim sum of 5, 6, and 7. All right, so uh, just because it can be a little tricky the first time that you see this, let me, let me do it out for you all. So also, how do I, I guess I clear. Oh, awesome, okay. So, so I see some of the right answers here. So if we write out five in binary, we get one, zero, one. If we write out six, you get one, one, zero. If you write out seven, you get one, one, one. And now we go column by column. If we go through the two to the zero pile, we have two ones, which give us a zero. If we go to the two to the first pile, we have two ones, which gives us a zero. And if we go to the two to the second pile, we have three ones, which give us a one. So the nim sum of five, six, and seven is just one, zero, zero. And what we want to do from this position is we want to balance it, right? Because because the nim sum is not zero, we call the position unbalanced. So we want to make a move to then balance it. And what we saw is, all right, well, we only have one uh, pile. We only have four at the end when we compute the nim sum. So we can remove four from any of the possible piles in order to make the nim sum zero. So let me draw this out here for you all. So if I, for instance, remove four from the pile of five, then I'm going to be left with one here. And this one becomes a zero then. And now if I compute this nim sum, I'm now going to have, again, this column hasn't changed, so it's still zero. This one is still zero, but this column is now also zero. So now the piles are balanced. And the goal of each position in the game of nim is just to find a move in order to balance the positions. So we also see that if you remove four from the second pile, you balance them, or four from the last pile, you balance them. Now let's take a look at maybe a slightly more complicated example here. And in this more complicated example, you have three piles of size 9, 10, and 15. And yeah, exactly. It's kind of like mod 2 per digit. If you have an odd number of ones, it's a 1. If you have an even number of ones, it's a 0. So if we do 9, 10, and 15, we can write 9 in binary is 1, 0, 0, 1, 10 in binary is 1, 0, 1, 0, and 15 in binary is just 1, 1, 1, 1. And again, we're going to do it column-wise in order to compute the nim sum. So we start in the 2 to the 0 pile, and we're going to get 1, 0, 1, and because there's two ones, we put a 0 below it. In the 2 to the first pile, we have two ones, so we put a 0 below it again. And in the two to the second pile, we have only one one, so we put a one below it. And in the two to the third pile, we have three ones, so we also put a one below it. And we get a nim sum 
of not actually 13 because we have 1, 1, 0, 0. So it's a nim sum of 12. Um, and now to balance it, it's a little bit more complicated in order to figure this out because it doesn't look obvious how we're going to be able to balance this, right? But the basic idea is we want to flip these two bits that are on the left. The two bits on the left are currently 1, 1. And we want to make both of them into a 0. So what we can do is we can say, all right, we have 1, 0 currently. If we can turn this into a 0 followed by a 1, I don't know how well that showed up. But if we can turn that into a 0, 1 instead, let me undo that. Maybe let's see if I can try this a bit better. Uh, that's not too much better, sorry. All right, so let's just turn that into a zero and that into a one. Then we'll be able to balance all of the, all of the piles. Um, oh, can, can you guys see the drawings that I'm uh, doing on the uh, board, by the way? Are you able to see that? Okay, cool. Good. <laughs> Good. Uh, so then, because the two to the second pile is going to have a nim sum of zero, and the two to the third pile, because that's now a zero up here, uh, that's also going to be a zero. So in this case, then the piles will all be balanced. And even easier than doing that was, all right, so that was one option for how we could balance all the piles. But what if in the pile of 15, what if we just get rid of the last two bits? So what if instead of having 1, 1 here, we just turn that into 0, 0? Then again, the nim sum of all the piles will be 0 if we make this into a 3. So the general idea from each position is you just want to find a move in order to balance it. And uh, there's a full mathematical analysis that you can do with this as well. I have that in the notes, which I'll send out after this talk is over. Um, it takes a, quite a bit to build up to that full analysis. Um, so I'm not going to do it now, but because I want to get to the other game that I have at the end. But do you want to try one more example of a winning position? So let's say we're currently in the position, and I'm not going to give you the table again this time, one, two, uh, four, five. One, two, four, five. What should you do from this position to win? And I'll begin drawing out the nim sum here as we do it. So one, two, four, five is the current position. What should you do in order to win? Excellent. So I say that some of you, some of you were able to figure it out. And sorry, I'm just doing this on my computer, so it's not that great. Um, so we had a few different ideas here, but let's just start. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to write it all out in binary. So one in binary is zero, zero, one, two is zero, one, zero, four is one, zero, zero, and five is one, zero, one. If we compute the nim sum of this column, because there are only two ones in it, and we're not able to increase it. So we're not able to go from four to six. Even though that would be nice if we could, we always have to decrease the piles. Um, so 1001 zero, zero, one is going to be a 0. Now 0100, zero, 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 because there's only an odd number of 1s, that's going to be a 1. And in the very leftmost one, because you have an odd number of 1s again, or even number of 1s, you also have a 0. So the nim sum is just 010. Zero, zero. And we see that we have two left over. And as some of you noticed, if we just get rid of this pile of two, then everything will balance. So we get rid of this pile of two, then the nim sum will perfectly balance and we'll be left in the position 145. And if we go back to our table from before, I clear the drawing. If we go back from the table before, we see that 145 is indeed a desirable position to leave uh, your opponent in. So 
the easy version of how do we beat this game is just have a table like this and memorize the table. The more complicated uh, way to do it is, all right, convert the numbers to binary, com compute the NIMSUM in your head, and then determine which pile to remove uh, chips from in order to completely balance the NIMSUM. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's a little bit hard, but, uh, and then for large numbers, in order to do that in your head, you would definitely require a computer. But I don't think anyone would really be saying, hey, let's go play this with 100 chips in a pile. That would be a little bit ridiculous. Um, so if you want to read up, yeah, the table would be totally impossible for large numbers as well. Um, because you just couldn't memorize it. So it is much easier to do it with binary still. And if you want to read up fully on the proof and the strategy, uh, the full proof is right here. It gets a little bit complicated, which is why I want to get to the last game of the night before, uh, before we wrap up here. But you can read this and you can send me an email if you have a question. Um, and heap is kind of interchangeable with pile. So heap and pile mean the same thing to me here. And yeah, with large numbers, because neither player will know who are winning, unless you're playing a computer, you just play randomly until uh, the numbers are small enough that you can figure out what's going on again. Um, the last thing I want to mention with the game of NIM is the Mizera play, which is when it is your goal um, to not be the one who removes the last chip. And I'm going to show you an example with just very simple piles. So let's assume that you have piles of size 311, okay? So if you have um, piles of this size, 311 in the piles, then normally the play from here would be to remove three, right? You would get rid of these three, leaving your opponent with a position one one. However, under the Missouri version of the game, your goal is to not be the one who takes the last one. So if you do that, that will actually be a bad play. What you can do instead is let's say that you just remove these two. Then the new position of the game will be 111. From here, your opponent will remove one, you will remove one, then your opponent rem will remove the last one. Therefore, since now you don't want to remove your last one, your opponent will win. Or sorry, therefore you will win, my bad. So because you don't want to remove the last one, your opponent removes the last one, so you win in this case. And the same thing happens uh, for four piles here. If you have four piles, you can just remove these three. And ultimately the goal is to leave your opponent with an odd number of ones. So the goal is leave your opponent with an odd number of ones. And we can see the strategy in general because you're in a play totally normally up until the end, up until there's only one pile of size greater than one. And at this point, you're either going to reduce this pile to size one or zero, and your goal is whatever leaves your opponent with an odd number of piles with only one in it. And so you change your play slightly at the end, but it's basically the same game. So hopefully this is enough intuition that if anyone comes up to you on the street and is like, hey, let's play a game of NIM, any style of the game, you'll be able to beat them. But I do want to mention the very last game, which is Fibonacci NIM, which you'll see why it's called Fibonacci NIM in a minute, because it's not immediately obvious. But here's how the game goes. We're going to say there are N chips on the table, and A and B are two players who are going to alternate removing chips. And what they do is on the first move, a player is not allowed to take all, the, all of the chips. And on each subsequent move, the number of coins removed can be any number up to two times the previous move. So you can choose any number of chips up to twice the previous move. So for instance, if I took three chips on my last move, you can take up to six chips on your move. And the winner in this game, it's normal play. So your goal is just to remove the very final chip, leaving your opponent with none. And I have three questions here to play it out for these large values. But instead of doing that, let's play it out with a very small value just to get some intuition. So because 140 and 144 are very large numbers, let's start with only 10 chips. And um, how about, let's play everyone here. All right, so we're starting with 10 chips. I'll go first. So on my first move, 
I will take two chips to leave you all with eight chips. Now you can take a maximum of two times two or four chips. How many do you want to take? Hmm. All right, so you say three, but if you take three chips, leaving me with five, then I can just take all five to win, right? Because uh, th the maximum number of chips you can take is six in that case. So taking three from here isn't the best idea. So how about you take two instead? So if you take two chips, then I'll be left with six chips. Now I'm going to take one chip, leaving you all with five. What do you want to do now? Yeah, again, if you take two, then I'm gonna take all three and win. So instead, take one here. Then I'll be left with four, and I'll take one also, leaving you with three. What do you do now? You can only take one, leaving me with two, from which place I now win, since I can take all two. So I'll write out the game that we just played. So here are the two possible games that I think may be played. And I think that this was the one that was just played, the second one that I posted here, because we went 10, 8, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 0. And just as a small aside, I'm going to see if anyone can notice this. And I may have given an array by telling you the name of the game. What do you notice about all the values that are in the row with B? What do you notice about the numbers 8, 5, and 3? Anything in particular, any special properties that these numbers uh, satisfy? They're Fibonacci numbers, awesome. So all these numbers are Fibonacci. And just as a small thing that we were discussing before, so what's a reasonable upper bound for the first player to take in a game starting with 10 chips? What number would I not want to take? How many would be too many chips for me to take? Four. Yeah, because so I'll take a maximum of three chips because if I take four or more, then you can take eight chips and you'll win immediately. And in general, for a starting position with N chips, the first player should not take more than the floor of N divided by three. In this case, the floor of 10 divided by three is three. So you shouldn't take more than three chips. And then I already asked you, what do you notice about all the numbers on B's turn? And they're all Fibonacci numbers. So really quickly, before I get to the full analysis of the game, I need one quick theorem. And it's a kind of cool theorem, and I like how it works. So it says that every positive integer n can be represented uniquely as a sum of distinct non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers that all start with a second Fibonacci number. So let's take a look, because this is kind of a surprising property if you have not actually seen or proven it before, and it's known as Zeckendorf's theorem. So for n equals 100, how would you try to find a sum uh, or sequence of distinct non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers to sum up to 100? Where would you start? Yeah, it's almost like a number basis. Like you're writing a number in terms of Fibonacci's. It's kind of, kind of weird. So yeah, you, you need two components to this proof. You need to prove that it exists and that's unique. But just for the number 100, how would we write 100 as a sum of distinct non-consecutive Fibonacci's? Sweet. It's a really good suggestion. So we're going to kind of use a greedy strategy, which means we're just subtracting off the largest Fibonacci number that's less than it. So if we list out all the Fibonacci numbers uh, up to 100, we see the largest one is 89. So we can begin by writing 100 as 89 plus 11. Now, 11 is much easier for us to deal with. Now, how can we write 11 as a sum of uh, Fibonacci numbers? There we go. All right. So then we subtract off the next largest Fibonacci number less than, less than 11, which is eight. And then we see we get F11 plus uh, F6 or 89 plus 11 plus three. But three itself is already a Fibonacci number. 
So therefore, we can write 100 as 89 plus 11 plus 3. And the method that works here actually always is going to work, and it's known as a greedy strategy. So the method of subtracting off the largest Fibonacci number less than a number is known as a greedy strategy. And for this, I'm just going to prove the existence of a representation. I'm not going to prove uniqueness because that gets a little bit tricky. But in order to do this, we're going to just use a proof by induction. All right. So for the base case of one, the unique representation is pretty easy. And we're now going to assume that every integer up to k can be written as the unique sum of distinct non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. If we let f sub a be the largest Fibonacci number, such that f sub a is less than or equal to k plus 1, um, then we're basically just doing the same thing we did before, finding the largest Fibonacci number less than or equal to it. And if f sub a is equal to play k plus 1, so if it already is a Fibonacci number, then we're done. Otherwise, we know that k plus 1 is between f sub a, because it's less than, and it's also less than f of a, uh, f sub a plus 1, because we assume that this was the largest Fibonacci number less than or equal to it. But when we subtract off these quantities, we see that k plus 1 minus f sub a is less than f of a plus 1 minus f of a, which is just f of a minus 1 which is really helpful for us. Because now, if we're going to rewrite this, we know that f of a minus 1 already has a representation. And we can rewrite that representation of f of a minus 1 right here. And that's written as a sum of distinct non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. And furthermore, since uh, the difference is less than uh, f of a, we know that it's not going to uh, be consecutive. So we know that we're basically going to skip f of a minus 1 in our representation of k plus 1 there. And that's going to be our entire thing. So we're basically able to use our representation of the smaller number to make a big one for k plus 1. And that's the basic idea. It's just a quick uh, little inductive proof. Uh, don't worry if you didn't get every detail there. The main idea is, um, oh, sorry, yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, yeah, what Mr. Kaiser said was right there. So you, uh, the difference of k plus 1 minus f sub a already has a representation. So that's the quantity that I circled. The difference already has a representation. And because that difference is less than f of a minus 1, uh, we know that uh, it will skip f of a minus 1 as representation and have all numbers smaller than that. So it's a quick little inductive proof. Um, and you can also prove uniqueness using kind of a similar technique, but we're going to skip over that just to get to the general strategy of the game. So we're going to consider more general positions in this game as a pair. So instead of just a number, it's going to be a pair, r and, and q where r is the number of chips that are remaining, and q is a quota, which is the maximum number of chips a player can remove in the next move. So as a basic example, if there are 10 chips and the first player took two, what would the new position be in terms of r and q? So we have 10 chips, and we take away two. What would the new position be? Maybe I'll just give it to you. So the new position is going to be 8 and 4. And the reason the first number is 8 is because 10 minus 2 is 8. But the reason the second number is 4 is because the second player can now take a maximum of 4 chips. So this is how we're going to kind of represent general positions of the game. And now it's going to get a little bit tricky. So we're going to call a position nice if the quota Q is at least the smallest term in the Zeckendorf representation of R. Otherwise, it is not nice. Um, so in, we're going to analyze how uh, one game played out, the game that we played earlier, using this criteria. So in this table, I have three, uh, four columns here. 
So I have a column for R, which is the number of chips that are remaining, Q for the quota, then I have the Zeckendorf representation of R and whether or not the position is nice or not nice. So for R equals 10, the representation, Zeckendorf just is a fancy way of saying sum of Fibonacci numbers. The sum of Fibonacci representation is two plus eight. But the quota is nine in this case. So the smallest number, which let me just uh, draw it here. So the smallest number, which is two, is less than or equal to nine. So because two is less than or equal to nine, we call this position nice. On the other hand, for now, if there's eight, then because that's already a Fibonacci number, the Zeckendorf is just eight. However, the quota in this case is four. And because the quota is not at least the, num the smallest number in the Zeckendorf, we just can't subtract it off. So this position is not nice. So now if you take one from this position, you get seven which can be written in uh, Fibonacci terms as two plus five. Now the smallest number in this second dwarf is two and the quota Q is also two. So because they're equal, we call this position nice. Now if you subtract off two, you get to a Fibonacci number five again. However, the quota is four. So because the quota is less than the smallest number in the second dwarf representation, we call this position not nice. Now, when there's four, that can be written as one plus three. And uh, in this position, we see that Q, the quota, is more than the smallest number of the secondary representation, which is one plus three. So we call this position nice. And then at the end, it's kind of obvious how it finishes. We get three, two, and then, um, and then from two, you're able to win because two, the quota is two, the Zeckendorf is two. So you can simply subtract two to win. And I saw that someone just raised their hand. Um, oh, someone was asking, how do you get the quota again? So the quota is twice the number uh, of chips that were taken in the last turn. So for instance, from going to 10 to eight, two chips were taken. So the quota is two times two or is four. Going from eight to seven, only one chip was taken. So the quota is two. Going from seven to five, two chips were taken. So the quota is four and so forth. Does that make sense? Great. Any other questions on what we just did here? All right, cool. And we're almost done. Or for those of you that are wanting to wrap up, uh, we're almost finished here. So what we can see here is the positions are gonna alternate be between being nice and being not nice. And this was exactly the same as we saw in every other game. In the divisors game that we saw before, the positions alternate between being even and odd. And in the game of NIM, the positions alternated between being balanced and unbalanced. Let's see if we can uh, analyze this game very similar to how we've analyzed the past games. So we are going to conjecture that all of the nice positions, which again, remember the quota is at least the smallest number of the Zeckendorf representation are winning and all of the not nice positions are losing. And again, just the same framework as before, we want to show that from every winning position, you have a move to a losing position. And from every losing position, every possible move is to a winning position. And the proof from here is going to get a little bit tricky, but we'll see if we can get through all the details. So let's assume that R comma Q is a nice position. And we're going to say that the Zeckendorf of R is going to be r is just equal to the sum of a bunch of Fibonacci numbers, f of a1 plus f of a2, all the way up to f of a sub m. And where they're no, uh, non-consecutive, so the difference between all of the two uh, indices are always going to be at least two. And the very first index we start with is at least two as well. So that's how we're going to write r. So we're assuming that this is a nice position. So that means that q is at least f sub a1, which is the smallest number in the Zeckendorf. So that means that the player can take f of a1 chips to result in the new position r minus f of a sub 1 and 2 comma f sub a1 is the quota. Because remember, the quota is two times the number of chips that were just taken. All right. And I'm going to claim that this position is not nice. And in order to see that, you can notice that r minus f of a1 is equal to f of a2 plus dot 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 plus all the way up to f of am. And it has the smallest term f of a sub 2. 
However, since a sub 2 is at least a 1 plus 2, we know that f of a sub 2 is at least 2 times f of a 1. The reasoning for this is that you always see when you go at least two more terms in the Fibonacci sequence, you at least double it. So for instance, when you go um, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, if you take the ratio of two terms that are two terms away, it's always going to be at least two. You can see this algebraically by, yeah, so the ratio of consecutive terms approaches the golden ratio. But if you take uh, the ratio of terms that are two away, we always know that the ratio is going to be at least uh, two. Because f of, if we just use the definition, you can take a look at what I just posted in the chat there, f of n plus two is at least two of f sub n. So anyway, so if you always take the ratio, uh, ratio of Fibonacci numbers that are at least two apart, the ratio is going to be at least two. So finally, wrapping up what we had uh, here. So the smallest term in the Zeckendorf representation is f of a2. However, we now see that f of a2 is at least two times f of a1. But if you remember from before, the quota was two of f a1. So the smallest term in the Zeckendorf representation is greater than the quota. So the position is not nice. So if we have a nice position, subtract the smallest number from the Zeckendorf representation of our number and you will have a winning move. That's a mouthful. So let me just give you a quick example. So let's say that the current position is 11 comma four. What should you do from here to win? So that means that there are 11 chips and you can take a maximum of four. What would be a winning move? There we go. So uh, because 11 is equal to eight plus three and the quota is at least the smallest number three, we can just subtract three to get the position eight comma six now. And because now this is the Fibonacci number, this is gonna be a losing for the other player. And we'll see why in a moment. So that's just the basic idea. Whenever you're in a position, try to, if you can, subtract off the smallest number in the Zeckendorf representation. Now we're gonna need to see the other way, which is we're gonna assume that, and by the way, the position eight comma six is not nice because the Zeckendorf of eight is just eight and eight is more than six. So it is more than the quota. So let's assume that we have a position that is not nice. Let's say it's R comma Q. And this means that the quota is less than the smallest term in the Zeckendorf representation of R. And we're gonna consider a general move. Because remember from before, from a winning position, we just need one possible winning move. From a losing position, we need every single possible move to result in a winning position for the other player. So we're gonna consider every single possible move, which is gonna consist of taking a number of chips that are between, um, I guess that are between one and Q. Sorry, that should say one less than or equal to X less than or equal to Q. So anyway, so those are the possibilities for X. So the resulting position is now gonna be R minus X and the quota is two times X because you just took away X chips. And let's assume for the sake of contradiction for now that this new position is not nice. So we're assuming that we started with a not nice position and we ended up with a not nice position. So say that R minus X is equal to F of B1 plus F of B2 plus all the way up to F of B sub L. And then where all of these Bs, the uh, difference between them, they're non-consecutive and the smallest B1 is at least two. Now the next thing that we're gonna do, uh oh, that showed way too much. No, I'm sorry about that. So we know that two X just by assumption, uh, because we're assuming that the position is not nice, we're assuming that 2x is less than the smallest number in the Zeckendorf representation of r minus x, which is f of b1. But now, let's consider it by itself just the Zeckendorf representation of x. 
if we write f x as a sum of a bunch of uh, consecutive, a distinct consecu non consecutive Fibonacci numbers, you get x equals f of a1 plus f of a2 plus all the way up to f of a sub m. And now we see as well, we have this cute little inequality that we see at the bottom because we know that f of a sub m is less than x. And we also know that 2 times x is less than f of b1 by our assumption. So we see that 2 times f of a sub m is less than f of b1. And what that means for us as well, by the same logic as before, we can see that b sub 1 is at least a sub n plus 2 because the ratio between these two terms is at least two. I mean, the ratio between consecutive terms of Fibonacci numbers approaches the golden ratio. The ratio is at least two. That means that the difference in the indices of, uh, of the Fibonacci numbers is at least two as well. And what that basically means at this point is we can put together the Zeckendorf representation that we have for X with the Zeckendorf representation we have for R minus X, because we know that r minus x plus x is just equal to r, right? So let's put together these two representations now. So let's concatenate them together. And that gives us that r equals x plus r minus x, which equals f of a1 plus f of a2 plus all the way up to f of am plus f of b1 plus all the way up to f of b sub l. But now we have something a little bit tricky. So we assume that in the beginning, we started with a not nice position. However, now f of a sub one, by our previous slide, we know that f of a sub one is less than x. So f of a sub one is less than x, but then it's also less than q. But we assumed at the beginning that the smallest term in the Zeckendorf representation of r was larger than q. And so that's a contradiction. So that means that the original position was not nice at all. So, uh, going back to our assumption, we started with a not nice assumption, a not nice position. We assumed that the new position we arrived, was, we arrived at was not nice. So that means that the new position that we arrived at must be a nice position, which in other words means that from every losing position, every possible move is to a winning position. So there are a lot of variables flying around there. So I went through that kind of fast, um, but that's just the basic idea. So going back to the original position, we can see that then when there is a Fibonacci number of chips in the starting pile at the beginning, the position is losing for the first player. Otherwise, the first player can always win. So in the original position of 144, we know that's losing because the Zeckendorf of 144 is just 144. And the quota, we can't take away all of that. Whereas 140 is a winning position because we can write that as the sum of a bunch of Fibonacci numbers. So we can write it as 89 plus 34 plus 13 plus three plus one. So in that position, we should just remove one. So that wraps up my kind of long analysis of Fibonacci numbers. Are there any questions on that? And um, I'll share the slides later so that you all can see them and you can see all the proofs and stuff but I'm gonna wrap up by just mentioning one result which kind of ties everything together. So there's this result in combinatorial game theory and it's called the Sprague-Grundy theorem. And it states that every impartial two-player game under the normal play is equivalent to NIMF. So every single possible game you could have with two players taking away chips or that um, impartial just means that the positions are the same for each player on every state of the game, it's always gonna be equivalent to NIMF. So if you can come up with any complicated game involving two players, there is some type of reduction that you can do to make it equivalent to NIMF. And I think that's really cool. Uh, so in the last game, we could have reduced it to NIMF if we wanted to, but it was already complicated as is, and we didn't need to make it any more complicated. Um, and yeah. That wraps up my presentation. I've got a few links at the end here too, if you want uh, some references or some fun online resources. Uh, there's one here where you can play NIM against the computer. If you want to see if you can test your theory of how you've done with NIM, um, there's a full mathematical analysis. And um, yeah, oh, and then yeah, Intermediate Counting and Probability. Art of Problem Solving's book has an excellent section on uh, two-player games as well. So if you want to check that out too, you can.
But uh, yeah, that wraps up my presentation. Uh, maybe Mr. Kaiser will provide me with all of your emails so, or I can just, uh, he can send this out later just so you all have the slides. And uh, thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed this and uh, hope you enjoyed the camp as well. Thanks, guys. Um, so yeah, I think it is, I believe this is recorded as well. So I think this will be available to you later. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Let's see, stop recording. I think we had something like uh, 20, I actually don't know.